Hi guys, welcome to Sean Watson Davis TV. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you would, please hit the subscribe button, the like button, drop a heart in comments, and share this video with at least one other person right now for me, please. Thank you so much. Today we have here with us the Cabules, Janice and Ernie Cabule, sharing their life of, uh, sharing their story of life, love, and COVID survival. Um, this couple has been married for 44 years. They are the parents of two children and three grandchildren. And this year, Ernie is in charge of the golden anniversary the Lance, of the Lansing chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha, Alpha fraternity. So we're going to get into that as well. So starting with Janice, ladies first, of course. Janice, if you would, please tell us where you were born and raised and a bit about your family structure. How many siblings? Uh, what number were you? And um, just a bit that tells us about your formation as you were growing up as, up as a child. What impacted the psychology of mind, the personality that prepared you for the life that was ahead of you? I was born in Chicago, Illinois and uh, moved to Lansing when I was six years old. And we moved here because both of my parents passed away. My grandmother was from Mississippi, Sunflower, Mississippi, and my grandmother moved to Chicago uh, during the uh, difficult times while we were in Chicago. My mother was uh, severely ill and my grandmother moved there to take care of her. My mother had heart problems and she had rheumatic fever as a child. There were five children at the time of my mother's death. I was the second oldest, I was five years old. My oldest brother was 13 and my sister was four. My brother was three and my youngest brother was six months old. At the time, my mother was carrying my um, youngest brother and um, ended up having a C-section. He survived that C-section. And, um, and today, of all the siblings of five of us, there are two that are left. Myself as the second oldest and my younger brother, um, Kenny Outlaw. My younger brother lives in Germany and he's been there for almost 40 years and he is a minister there. When we moved to Lansing, we moved here because my grandmother had two children, my mother and my uncle. My uncle, um, Sam Triplett, lived here, who at that time um, was married to his wife, Roxy Triplett. And my aunt and uncle had three children, um, Sudie Holloway, Emma, Emmy Triplett, and uh, Michael Triplett. So we moved to be near family and for family to um, help us out and help my uh, grandmother raise the five of us. I remember the night we moved. I, I remember it very clearly. I remember moving in the middle of the night, driving um, from Chicago, not knowing where we were going or where we were heading. I remember the night we arrived in Lansing and I remember feeling like there was a great loss and that loss was my mother. I also remember my mother's death. Um, and I remember as a child, um, my mom always loved all of us and I remember her being sick all of my life and I just didn't know why. So when we moved to Lansing, my grandmother immediately joined a church. Um, the first church that she joined was Union Baptist Church um, because we lived on Allegan Street. And from there, we moved um, from Allegan to St. Joe. And, and from St. Joe's Street, we moved on the north side. 
Once we moved on the north side, my grandmother changed her church home. Her church home was Mount Zion Baptist Church. I became a Baptist. I remember Reverend Graves, Mrs. Graves, and they influenced my life growing up. Um, Mrs. Graves was always a lady and always reminded me to be a lady, always reminded me to read all the time and to um, be the best that I can. My faith became strong because of Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. And I've always been in a church all my life. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jen. And now you, Ernie, tell us about your background. Um, my background is quite different from hers, actually. Um, I was born and raised in Detroit. Um, both parents, um, or I was raised with both parents, I'll put it that way, and also both sets of grandparents. Um, when I was younger in elementary school, we, my mom would drop us off at my grandmother's house and we would go from there to school and come back and she would pick us up and uh, we'd go on about our day. And um, then I got to junior high and high school where I walked to junior high, sat in junior high and then took the bus to Cass Tech. Finally graduated in 71 and went to, and I attended Ferris State College. Graduated from there in 76 and moved to the Lansing area. Um, in terms of experiences, um, when I came here, actually, I'll, I'll put it this way, when I first started Ferris, I didn't know a single person there. So I had to learn how to adapt and make friends. And I became a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity they, at the Zeta Beta chapter there. And then when I came to Lansing, once again, I only knew like one person when I got here. So it was uh, experience um, learning Lansing because I wasn't familiar with it. Uh, finding out that everybody knew everybody and I didn't know anybody. <laughs> <laughs> that and, was different from Detroit, right? <laughs> absolutely. And um, uh, at any rate, I um, moved on and um, Finally settled down a bit, um, and I met Janice um, one evening um, at Dooley's nightclub, and um, I had been hanging out for a while and had a lot of empty relationships, and uh, I finally asked God, I said, send me someone to love, and that's when I ran into Janice, and I'll never forget it because it seemed strange, but when she came in the door, I noticed this blue glow around her head, and I thought that was a little peculiar. Mm -hmm. and, as it turned out, they came in and uh, she was with a friend of mine from school and they sat at our table. So we got to talking <laughs> and um, you know, one thing led to another and the rest <laughs> is history. Here we are. And in terms of growing up, you grew up as an only child? Oh, yes. Um, no, I wasn't an only child. I had an older twin sister. So it was just the two of us, and um, I had a cousin that was born like six weeks after us, so he and I were more like brothers and cousins, and um, it was always just the three of us. Okay, so you are a part of a twin set. Right. And then you had a cousin who was born... Uh, I was born in November, he was born December, so okay. like six weeks. Six oh. weeks later, yes, and he becomes like a friend. He's like my relative, first best friend, friend first best friend, yes. kind of thing. Okay. I had good relationships. So you with got all your my brother, cousins, but yeah, he you was, got he your was brother, brother to go yeah. with the sister. Partner, partner, <laughs> in crime, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so now we have both grown up. And we are now in college, per on Ernie's side, um, at Ferris. And Janice, talk to me about your entry into the college section of your life. So the, the college section of my life, I started at uh, Lansing Community College. I was 18 mm -hmm. um, and I was very naive because my grandmother was a very strict Baptist. I didn't go anywhere and I didn't do anything. Okay. I met Ernie, like he said, um, at uh, Dooley's. I had went out with a friend mm -hmm. because I was going to move out and get a roommate. And so my friend was um, encouraging me to 
come hang out at Julie's with her. Yeah. And I thought that was a great idea. Sure. <laughs> so that I could meet my new roommate. Yeah. And my roommate happened to be a friend of Ernie's. Okay. Um, and so when she realized Ernie and I were um, talking to each other, she decided she didn't want me as her roommate anymore. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and, and that had to do with a friend of hers had liked Ernie. Um, gotcha. which, which was fine. Yes. And so I didn't end up as, as her roommate, mm -hmm. but I did end up as Ernie's roommate. Oh, okay. <laughs> down, <laughs> down, down, down the road. Wow. Um, and so um, at 19, um, we got married. Okay. Um, we were still young. Mm -hmm. And uh, so your courtship was how long? One year. Okay. Um, but it was three months before I became his roommate. Okay, all right. So, mm -hmm. so um, at that point, Ernie and I um, decided that we would make Lansing our home. Um, Ernie's job transferred him um, to Saginaw, Michigan. He was working for General Motors. Okay. He, we were there for how long? About six months. Six months, and he decided that uh, he didn't want to do that anymore. Um, it was a stressful job. He was on the road a lot. I was by myself and being young, there were a lot of things um, that I had to overcome. One, I didn't drive. Uh, I didn't start driving till I was 30. Wow, so, isn't that something? So Ernie worried about me uh -huh. all, all the time uh -huh. you know, while I was on the road. And so, um, and he decided that you know, I, I need to move back somewhere where I'm home. And that was a plus because then um, for us and our relationship, our relationship started growing more. Mm -hmm. um, I was very dependent on Ernie early on. Uh -huh. and, and he was very comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was because being raised by grandparents, it, it was a norm for him mm -hmm. um, to see his grandfather take care of his grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and for me, um, I was very blessed and I knew that I was blessed. Mm -hmm. Over the years, uh, when I started driving, um, I, I, I've worked various jobs. You know, I've been um, in the governor's office, uh, Governor Blanchard's office. Um, and that was a job where, um, at the time, uh, Beverly Nettles Nickerson, um, who is a good friend of mine's and, and also my youngest daughter's godmother, pushed me to start driving. And I've been very lucky. I've had wonderful friends um, that have supported me um, because I don't have a lot of family. My family is very small. My friends uh, have been the best of friends that have not only supported me, but nurtured me and, and also nurtured our relationship. So we got to see positivity in our lives. Um, both of us have great friendships. Ernie, I would say, still has a friendship with his kindergarten friend. They've been friends for how many years? Since kindergarten. <laughs> Since kindergarten. Um, what, 60 something years? <laughs> Wow. Almost so, 65 years, yes. And outstanding. And I know I don't have a kindergarten friend. My kindergarten friend would be in Chicago, and I couldn't remember who that would be. Exactly. Um, two and, of them, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I have two friends from kindergarten, put it that way. <laughs> Got you. Yeah. So you all truly value relationships. You're very relationship oriented, yes. clearly, um, and you value relationships. We do. We so do. that's important to 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 bring up in terms of relationship positivity and what it takes um, to actually walk that and not just talk that. Okay. So one piece I wanted to get from you, Janice, was what high school did you graduate from? Sexton High School. Okay, Sexton. Sexton Big Reds. And I, I, I had some struggles when I graduated from high school. Um, I developed, well, I ended up having my tonsils out um, when I was in sixth grade and it put me 
behind in school a year mm -hmm. uh, because it was so severe I could not go to school. Mm -hmm. I couldn't talk. I had to go into therapy. Uh, and so by the time I got to Sexton High School, I became very focused and ended up um, graduating the year that I needed to graduate. Mm, so I, wow. I was very proud of myself. Oh, absolutely. Another telling of a warrior spirit. Yeah. Married 44 four years. That's a warrior spirit there. And then here we have this uh, condition with respect to health that brings out that warrior spirit again. And I find that when people love to win, they like to finish what they start. Those kinds of qualities are the values that contribute to these long-standing relationships. Okay. Um, and Ernie, you graduated from Cass Tech. Correct. Okay. So then now going back to you, Janice, at LCC, did you complete that process? I did, okay. and, but I didn't finish the rest of the schooling after that. Okay. All right. Um, and I don't, I don't know why okay. it's, it's still in the future okay. for me to do that. Okay. Ernie laughs because I'm always saying to him, well, why don't you go back? <laughs> <laughs> But you're saying you did get your associates? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Outstanding. Wonderful. And was that in any particular emphasis or did you stick with the general just the ge prerequisites? Just, yeah, of just the general. Okay. Yeah. Got it. All right. Beautiful. All right. So now we are moving into the parenting phase of your relationship. So how long were you married before you became parents? About two years. Okay. And was that on purpose? Were you all trying to have a certain period of time as just a couple before becoming parents? Talk to me about what your thinking was on that. Hadn't really discussed it as far as I remember. It was just, you know, one of those things that comes along as you marry. Okay. It all wasn't, right. you know, a planned sequence of events. We're going to have a child here and then we're going to have another child eight years later. No, okay. <laughs> that's, that's just the way it happened. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Got it. And, and wait, I want to step back a bit because you graduated from Ferris and what was your degree in? I was a bachelor's in automotive and heavy equipment technology. Okay. Automotive and heavy equipment? Correct. And heavy equipment technology. And went to the second. I was the second black graduate of that program. Oh, the second back black graduate of that program. Okay. All right. And what occupation did that lead you into? Uh, when I first came to Lansing, I was uh, working through Oldsmobile Division, and I was in their district service manager training program. Um, that entailed uh, a lot of the office activities, checking on warranty claims, transportation claims, uh, customer service. I spent 19 months in customer service. And then um, I was promoted to a district service manager. My territory went from Saginaw over to Ludington up to Sault Ste. Marie and Newberry. I had 33 dealers to contact. So that got to be a bit stressful. As you said, we had to move up to Saginaw. Um, I had a cousin that lived there, same cousin actually, <laughs> but we lived on exact opposite ends of town. And um, Janice didn't drive, so she was stuck in the apartment by herself and I was on the road um, three out of the four weeks. For one week, I was able to come home every night, but up the rest of the time I was off on the road. Mm -hmm. So it made it a little difficult. Um, technology was far different back then as it is now. So. Um, reporting was done manually rather than you know being computerized and automated like it is so i would come back from a dealer that i wasn't going to see for another two or three months and there would be a complaint in my mail that i could have taken care of if i had known about it but you know that's the way technology was at the time so mm -hmm. um that was that um at any rate um in the long run it was a lot of stress that I wasn't really equipped to deal with. And I figured at 26, I was too young to let a job drive me nuts and it was time for a change. <laughs> Very good. Very good at 26. All right. Okay. So 
we're now going to go back to that parenting phase. So you have a son and a daughter, two daughters, two daughters. Two daughters. Okay. And tell me about your experience as parents, as young parents. What was that like? How did that um, impact you all as individuals and as a couple? Well, not having any experience with younger siblings, it was all a unique experience to me. I didn't quite understand everything that was required, although <laughs> I certainly did my, what I thought was my best at, at trying to make sure I did everything right. Mm -hmm. um, being a father of two daughters is a little different because I wasn't used to having daughters or anything. <laughs> but um, I didn't want them to feel like they should be relegated to some second status, you know, just because they were female, I taught them to do everything that a boy could do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as, as a aside, uh, Danielle had taken my car and gone to a party that she wasn't supposed to go to, wound up having a flat tire, <laughs> and she was trying to change the tire herself in a formal gown, <laughs> and so the police found her, and then they called, <laughs> called us, you know, and she, why is the police calling me about my daughter at, you know, one right, in the morning, so right. <laughs> that was a bit nerve-wracking, but... <laughs> And she just had that, you know, spirit, I can do this. I know what I'm doing. I can change the tire. You know? Right, right. So I just taught them that they can do anything they want to do. You know, they have little sets of tools and, you know, they're self-sufficient. And that's the way that I raised them because that's the way I, I was raised that you needed to be. I've always been self-sufficient. I never ask anybody to do anything. That's one of the hardest things for me to do is to ask for help because I've been blessed that I have capabilities and I can physically actually do anything except for brain surgery on myself. You know? Right, right, that, that's right. That's the spirit I have. That's the way I think of it. Sure. And Janice will tell you, there's very little I can't do. Gotcha. So, you know, I, I wanted to raise them with that attitude. There's you know, nothing that you can't do if you put your mind to it and apply yourself to it. Sure. And is Danielle the oldest? Yes. Okay. All right. And tell me, tell us about your second, the youngest, the baby. Uh, Miss A, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like my granddaughter, I called her the baby till she was about 15. And then I f figured out, well, I guess she's kind of old for me to call the baby anymore. But um, yeah, it, it was kind of special because I was 35 when she was born. I thought I was like too old to be, you know, a dad at that time. But everything worked out well. And uh, we have a great relationship with uh, both my daughters and all the grandkids and uh, it's worked out well. We've been, we've been very blessed. My, um, my, my parenting is a little different from Ernie's because being raised by a grandmother, uh, grandmothers love you and hug you and all that. My grandmother was mean. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we need to hear about them. That, hey, that's that's a part of you know. Yes, but she was very religious. Okay, um, mm -hmm. and and I guess you would say strict, very strict. Mm -hmm. um, but there wasn't anything she wouldn't do for us, and we knew that she loved us. But we knew that if we did something she wasn't happy about, we were certainly going to um, get spanked, mm -hmm. and we would remember that spanking. Mm -hmm. And growing up, for me. I watched my siblings continue to repeat the same thing over, and I would just watch them, and I never did it. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to do this. Right. And so I, I So you're learned, a live and learn person, a watch and learn, watch. don't have to learn everything through experience. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and my grandmother knew that. Mm -hmm. And so I always stepped back, and, and if something wasn't working, I would try something else again. And with my kids, I always felt that. Um, they should dream h higher than what their expectations were. And if they weren't reaching their expectations, I was going to help them reach those expectations. Um, that had always followed me because my grandmother only had a third grade education. Okay. Um, and I remember her learning to read and write once she um, uh, had adopted us. Uh, but she could count money. And she knew that if she sent us out to buy something and we didn't give her the right change back, she could count that money and let us know. 
And so I heard a lot of stories uh, with her growing up in Mississippi, uh, picking cotton in the cotton fields and, um, and having uh, two sisters um, and some step siblings. I never met her side of the family, except for the siblings. And I've only been to Mississippi maybe twice in my life. Um, and where they lived, they lived up in the hills. And so I found out I didn't like that. Um, it wasn't for me because the animals roamed the hills. And so, and I remember getting out of the car when I was younger and, um, and the animals chasing me. Mm. And, and having an outhouse. And, and I wasn't used to that. I was a city girl. Right. You know? I was from Chicago and I lived in Lansing. So, you know, uh, and my grandmother realized that wasn't for me and they never took me back again mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think I, I, I saw a little bit of both sides with the grandparenting. And then I was able to see my cousins growing up with my uncle raising them. Um, so I knew what kind of parenting that I wanted for my kids. I wanted to love them. I wanted to nurture them. I wanted them to know that that I was there every step of the way. And both of us have been there every step of the way. That loyalty. Mm -hmm. yeah, my situation was a little different because my mom was a school teacher and my dad worked at Wayne County Juvenile. And out of all the stupid stuff that I did growing up as a kid, the one thing that I knew I wasn't going to do was I was never going to be stupid enough to wind up down a juvenile. <laughs> I could do a whole bunch of other dumb stuff, but I was going to be, <laughs> I was never going to be that stupid. <laughs> right. Exactly. So again, that's kind of that commonality too, that you all are both very observant mm -hmm. and you process, you think, and you determine that, Hey, you know, I'm going to use my, my head to draw the line in terms of what I'm going to do, not going to do what I want, et cetera. Right. Well, it's basically, like she said, a structured relationship. They gave me a lot of freedom because I used to ride my bike all over the west side of Detroit. People were always telling my folks where they'd see me, and they were shocked about it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, with both of them having experience with young people, you know, they, they could see what was coming, and they, they would, you know, know beforehand, they would know before I even did it that I was going to be in trouble. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. don't do that, you know. Of course, I would do it and find out why I shouldn't do it, so. <laughs> right, right, right. But not uh, with that juvenile situation. Nope, nope, you you but, knew for yourself that right. that was not you. you right. Not want that life. Well, you know, like I said, they were, my mom was a school teacher and my dad worked at juvenile and they had seen everything. Mm -hmm. All facets of irregular behavior, shall we say, and, sure. uh, you know. They didn't let me get away with anything. I had to wait until I went to school to act up. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> All right. So you guys both have that in common too. Kind of a strict, I mean, you had that freedom and independence going on, but at the same time, your parents, it sounds like they did rule the roost. Absolutely. Yeah. Because there wasn't any talking back or raising eyebrows or tone of voice, none of that stuff. No, you, uh, <laughs> you learn that wasn't going to work and you best uh, behave yourself. Ex excellent. I remember when Ernie met my grandmother for the first time. Uh, my grandmother carried a cane and uh, I was moving out and moving in with Ernie. And she was not happy because she wanted us to get married first. Mm -hmm. We knew we were going to get married, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. We kind of went, away, went, went around the way backwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, she wanted to move out, and so I was uh, amenable to having her as a roommate because we had a relationship by that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. you know, and you were already know. working yes. and had a solid income and, right. and that type of thing, so you felt like, hey, I can serve yeah. as the foundation. You're ready to move out. I'm ready to move uh -huh. out. Uh -huh. I'm in my first year of college. Mm -hmm. I think I got this. Mm -hmm. And so I tell my grandmother, you know, I'm moving, and she says, with who? Um, what was interesting was she never could get Ernie's name right. Okay. She called him Honey. Okay. And so when Ernie would come pick me up and she'd say, oh, there's Honey out there again. Mm -hmm. And Honey came to the door this time when yeah. I'd had my things all packed up and my grandmother came to the door also. We called her Big Mama because she was a big lady, mm -hmm. um, but she was petite. Mm -hmm. um, and so she came to the door, Ernie came in 
and she started talking to him. Do you remember what she said to you? Well, she asked me, um, you know, what's, what's with this moving and stuff? Or, you know, what do you think you're doing? Or do you plan to get married? Well, you know, and I was honest about it. I said, yes, the thought had crossed my mind. You know, <laughs> I wasn't trying to be flipped, but I was a little intimidated by her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's just the way it came out, because I was trying not to say too much so I wouldn't upset her, you know. Right. And just lay out just the facts, man. So, yes, I thought about it, you know, yeah. and I was honest. And, I didn't want to go into any other details because that's about as far as we thought about it. <laughs> right, exactly. But she liked you. She liked you. Um, and, of course, I didn't date a lot, so I didn't I didn't bring home people, and I think she knew that uh, Ernie was the one. Mm -hmm. When I met Ernie's side of the family, it was very interesting because um, they were like, are you going to marry her, Ernie? What's going on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and they felt like you were dragging your feet. Well, they thought I was robbing, robbing the cradle, actually, but because uh, <laughs> he was five years younger than me, so right. What's so she's eighteen this? at this time, yeah. or she's mm -hmm. 18, eighteen at this time, and you're twenty four at that time. Twenty four, yeah. twenty four and eighteen, twenty four and eighteen. Okay, we got it. So. Mhm. Mm um, you know, it was quite scandalous that she had moved in with me like that. Mhm. Mm it was interesting because. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you all were courageous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, we we came home one uh, one weekend, and my mom asked, "Well, where is Dennis going to sleep?" I said, "Well, me, of course." Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, so my mom had to say, "Well, you know, they're grown people. I guess that's what you know." Right. She said, "Well, it is what it is." <laughs> uh huh. Yep. So. And and that is true. You all were adults, and you were making your choices. And it turned out beautifully. Well, it worked out, yes. Yeah, it turned out beautifully. So you all wound up getting married. How did, how did that happen? How Did you propose? Did you get down on one knee? How did that wound up happening? Wind up happening? Truthfully, I don't remember. Okay. Um, I don't remember any, you know, prescribed uh, routine about it. Uh -huh. Just we decided we wanted to get married and, and we set a date and that was it. Did you go to the Justice of the Peace? Uh, we went to our minister. Okay, Re Reverend Grace. Reverend Grace. I, I think we talked about it, and out of the blue, we just said, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And um, we went and talked to my pastor, and everybody was uh, basically saying, well, don't you want to do a big wedding? We had thought about that, mm -hmm. and we changed our minds because we felt like at that time, People were upset with us because we were living together. Mm -hmm. So so let's get married. My grandmother had said, listen, I'm never going to come visit you until you get married. Mm -hmm. And so that was in the back of my mind and in the back of Ernie's mind. His mom was disappointed in him. Mm -hmm. But his father, on the other hand, really liked me mm -hmm. and thought that once Ernie had met me, um, because Ernie's mother and father were divorced, and his father did not see much of Ernie. And one of the things I said to Ernie, family was very important to me. Mm -hmm. I said, if we're going to get married, I've got to meet everybody. Okay. i got, I got to know what I'm getting into. I'm, I'm only 18. What do I know? Mm -hmm. I know there's a mother and a father. Well, and sounds I had like met you're your pretty wise there. Right? Yeah, you had some <laughs> right. wisdom going on. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. So when I met his father, um, there was great love um, instantly. Um, he, there wasn't anything he would not do for me. Uh, Ernie, on the other hand, you know, he felt like... <laughs> he knows better. <laughs> he, he felt like uh, Ernie being his son can take care of himself. But me being um, the daughter-in-law, he felt like he should be there for me. And he was always there for me. His mother was too. Um, his mom um, was very proper, raised proper, three, three sisters. Well, there was some tension... You know, and then it cleared up. But as it turned out, uh, since we felt this, uh, I don't want to say animosity, but uh, unpleasantness. And so we decided, well, we're just going to go ahead and get married and get it open and done with so everybody be happy. So um, none of my family was invited. There was only five of us there, me and my best man, Ben, her sister, and her friend. And there was just the five of us. Yeah, Jim. And that was it. Okay. Yeah. And and Pastor Graves. And Pastor okay. Graves, yeah. yeah. All right. and who tried to talk us out of it. 
He and, did. Yes, and we got married on a Friday. Uh huh. And we went to the point after for our reception. <laughs> yeah, he he felt we should have had the family. Uh, thinking back on it, you know, we we should have. Mm -hmm. yeah. We we know that mm -hmm. now because mm -hmm. uh, we that was a hurdle we had to get over too. Because um, then they were upset. They were with upset you with us. Because, together. Right, they were part of the wedding. You know, didn't know anything. Right. right. Yeah. I get that. So, you know. I understand why you thought not to do it. <laughs> and I also understand how it goes with the aftermath. You can see that. You can see both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can see both perspectives. If only we had a crystal ball. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. We do the best we can. And, uh,. If only we had a crystal ball. Okay, so the wisdom of the family, though, is that after you all had gotten married, how long did it take for both sides of the family to now function without that tension? And what did, did, you, did you all have to do anything to massage that to accomplish where everybody is now at peace and we're all good? I, I think they were at peace um, afterwards. The shock wore off um, fairly quickly because your mom hosted a reception for the cousins, for us to meet the cousins um, on your father's side, remember? And you... Well, I remember, I think things calmed down when uh, Dennis became pregnant with the first child and uh, Whatever animosity, bad feelings, et cetera, kind of went out the door then because, you know, now there's a baby on the way and there's a lot of excitement about that. Mm -hmm. As my mom's first grandchild, you know, women grandchildren. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, everything was basically uh, pretty good after that. Awesome. My, my grandmother, it was instant. Like once we were married, that was it. Okay. Excellent. And then the hosting of the um, the reception was an olive branch by his mom. By his mom for mm -hmm. the side of the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. very nice. Very nice. Okay, so we're in that parenting phase. Tell me what your parenting styles were like. Um, were you all always compatible as parents? Or did you have different styles, kinks that you had to work out? Tell me about that section of your lives. Well, my dad was a military man and I was more authoritarian about everything. Um, you know, this is what I say, this is what you're going to do and that's the end of the question. Whereas Janice would sit up and I would call them arguments, she said discussions, but I was never open to that. You don't talk back to me, I'm the parent, you know, and that's it. I've said my word and you're going to do what I've told you. Okay. And so. And you mentioned you were more the love, nurturance, okay. the grandmother style. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So did you all ever, did you all wind up just respecting one another's styles or did you wind up? having to compromise and bend with one another? How did you all work through those differences? Um, I think early on with the children, it was easy. Okay. It was um, the middle school years and definitely the high school years that things started changing. Early on in our relationship, we had a date night and we always said, okay, Tuesday night or Wednesday night, no matter what, let's, uh, let's go out on a date. And I remember, as my um, oldest daughter entered middle school, things became more challenging for us. Um, and I remember one night, my husband and I had a date night and it was a serious date night. And we said, okay, let, let's go for a drink. Okay, we, we gotta sit down and talk about this. And so we, so we did. We, we have always talked about everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And my kids are always confused about it because uh, my kids will call and ask me something, and then they'll call and ask him something, not knowing that we talk about that. Um, so if 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 they want to borrow money, immediately I talk to them about that. If they want to borrow money from him, he does. And even now, you know, they're 40 and 33, they still think we don't talk to each other. <laughs> Danielle is 40, 
40. And Alexandra is 33. 33. Um, it, it amazes me because that is one thing Ernie and I've always talked about everything. Um, it's, it's, it's important. Early on, Ernie, um, if you wanted to talk to Ernie, Ernie is the kind of person, food is very important to him. And so if he gets a bowl of ice cream every night, we know that we can sit down and talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> and he, Love st it. he still does that. Okay. So I would wait till he, he would get his bowl of ice cream uh -huh. because he listens very well while he's eating. What's and your favorite so <laughs> flavor? Uh, fudge marble. Fudge marble. Okay. All right. Every, every night every, dessert. Every night. Cool. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted it's a, you. A little overstated, but yeah, I, I had to cut back after I, I got sick, but uh, I'm, I'm slowly going back to it. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Okay, so what was it about those older years that were more challenging? I think for me, not having a mother that I could go to and say, how did you handle this situation? Or a grandmother who had passed on. And then Ernie's mom living in Detroit, um, you know, I never thought about picking up the phone and saying, how did you handle this? Um, and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. That just, it just that we, we didn't have that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of struggling with things and learning that, this is the norm, and talking to uh, other parents on parenting. How you know? How did you handle this situation? Being um, at Trinity was a blessing for me because there were a, a lot of moms at that time who were all raising teenagers. So I got to learn a lot from um, Diane McMillan and uh, Jesse Fry and Rolaine Johnson. You know, on on different things to try, because mm -hmm. we all had girls, mm -hmm. um, and, and all these girls were uh, close, and they all ended up being debutantes together. Mm -hmm. So the, the struggle was very real for me. Mm -hmm. um, for Ernie being a father, it was not as much, because mothers are very protective of daughters. Uh, My know, fathers are too, but we have a different way of going about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Yep, so in those middle years, the kids are wanting more independence. Right. They're getting mouthy and yes. all that kind of stuff yes. like that. Got it. All right. So after the kids uh, graduate, do either of them go on to college? Yes. Okay. Yes. They, oh. My oldest went to Temple University okay. um, in Philadelphia. Um, and her degree is in uh, kinesiology. Okay. And my youngest um, is is kind of uh, figuring out what she really wants to do. She started off at the community college and now that she's 33 years old, she's deciding what do I really want to do with my life. Mm -hmm. So, Because she's been always into the dancing. Into the dancing and, and acting and mm -hmm. all that she's kind of She's more artistic. Stuff. Yeah, she, mm -hmm. is, she is my artistic one. Mm -hmm. Got it. Beautiful. All right. So now tell us about grandparenting. We've got three grandchildren. Three grandchildren. Ernie absolutely loves being a grandfather. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Best thing in the world for him. I love spoiling my babies. No two, no two ways about it. Um, um, it's just. What's the composition in terms of gender? Uh, two girls and one boy. Okay. And who came first? Uh, Joy was the first. Mm -hmm. And then there was Maceo. And now uh, sweet baby Marissa. All right. Because she's the sweetest thing. <laughs> she's the sweetest thing. Marissa? Yes. All right. All right. So we got the grandson sandwiched in between the two granddaughters. Oh, right. All right. Beautiful. So in terms of uh what's your style of grandparenting um 
is there any difference between um, how you grandparent the boy versus the girls? What's the whole style? And how often do you get to see them? What's the routine with the grandparenting? Well, generally speaking, I would say I'm a lot more patient now than I was when I was a parent. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes it a little easier. I'm a little calmer about things. Uh, I try to reason with the kids and, and let them understand that I love them but um, I don't like what they're doing, and there, there's a separateness, you know. I don't just dislike you because you did something. I just dislike what you did, and you have to understand the difference. And um, all shucks, I just love my babies, and that's all I can say. That's wise, <laughs> awesome. What about for you, Janice? Um, for me, um, my oldest granddaughter, Joya, um, is a blessing, and the name Joya um, is a third generation Joya. There are four Joyas in our families. Oh. Um, and they're on his side of the family. Oh, nice. So when I think of her, I always think of Joy. Yeah. And um, even though she's 15 now, she still brings that joy. I, I, I feel names are very important. And I feel like mm. my daughters really thought this out. My second grandchild, Maceo, is a fourth generation of Maceo's. Ernie's middle name is Maceo. Nice. And, uh, and Maceo lives up to his name. Mm. He is uh, just like his grandfather. He wants to be like his grandfather. He wants to dress like his grandfather. Um, and he wants to be an alpha. Oh, so, yeah. And then there's Marissa, who is seven months old, who is an absolute darling. <laughs> she, uh, we chat with her two or three days a week on Zoom. Um, she's happy all the time. Just a happy, happy baby. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And the kids live where? Danielle is in uh, Jersey, City. Jersey City. Jersey City. And Alex lives um, in Lansing, um, near East Lansing almost. Okay. All right, so tell us about COVID. Well, let me do this. Empty nest. How long have you all been empty nesters? <laughs> <laughs> because that's a phase there. <laughs> empty nest. Yeah, so that was interesting because um, after uh, Danny went, left to go to um, Philadelphia mm -hmm. and um, Alex had moved out with her boyfriend at the time, so we were empty nesters for about a week, and then Janice's sister moved in with us. Okay. And then um, Danny had to move back in with us, and so her sister left, and then Alex moved back in with us. So we had a full house. There was eight of us in the house. Wow. Okay. Uh-huh. So that lasted for eh, about four years or so, five years. Okay. And... It wasn't until about two years ago, because Danny left and then Alex left, and so we had a quote-unquote empty house for the last about two years or so. About the last two years, yes. empty nest. So do you like that, or was it too empty? How did that go over with your personalities? Um, for Ernie, he's okay with that. Okay. Uh, the house is quiet, and I, and I do like the solitude, uh, because... Joya and Alex have stayed with us for probably about 10 years, okay. you know, on and off. Mm -hmm. and, and Joya is very quiet, so you really didn't know she was there. But it's just the fact that having other people in your home, mm -hmm. and, and now there's the two of us. So, you know, he has his room, I have my room. Um, I like to talk, he doesn't like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> He likes jazz, and I like all kinds of music. Uh -huh. So, you know, we, we find it kind of interesting. He gets in my car, I have gospel music on, and he changes it to jazz. Yeah. And so there's just, we always have that little bit of thing kind of going on, a little rivalry thing. Sure. We get in the kitchen, we cook together, and... Uh, and She's he, always in the way. I'm always in the way. <laughs> you know, we, we, we sit down to watch television together, you know, he likes sports, and... I like sappy movies and 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the mm-hmm. opposite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Housewives, you know, dumb stuff. I, uh-huh. I, don't, I don't say dumb stuff, but uh-huh. stuff I'm not interested in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I could do without all that drama, and she just loves it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. These are the realities. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, these are the realities. And yet, successfully married 44 years. Well, it takes accommodation and and compromise and, you know, you just let them do what they do and they let you do what you do and and as long as it doesn't violate any standards, then we're good. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And in terms of common ground, what do you all both like to do? Well, right now we are uh, currently taking hustle classes on Tuesdays. Oh, nice. Dancing. Dancing. Uh Uh-huh. And we found out uh, after Ernie had COVID, um, we strongly feel that his exercising really is what got him through that period. Mm. Um, Hustle classes, I've always liked hustle classes, but I never could get him to go. Mm -hmm. And and now he faithfully uh, goes with me. Um, One of his uh, fraternity brothers just started a uh, hustle, classes but they opened up a studio um rock the block with the nordays oh and yeah so, i've seen them advertise mm-hmm. yes uh-huh the classes are fun mm-hmm. okay. they're absolutely fun mm-hmm. we, we we feel like um the two of us sometimes it's just the two of us in the room yeah um sometimes it is just the two of us mm-hmm. but you know for us we feel like this is good exercise and mm-hmm. it's healthy yes good for the for the mind Uh Um, and it's good not only for the legs because you know as you get older things stiffen up a little bit more that's right circulation Mm -hmm. Ernie's a smooth hustle dancer Mm -hmm. all right (laughs) rock the block with the Nordes Mm -hmm. excellent 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 what made you decide to finally go ahead and go with her well, we have a ball coming up, and I wanted to be able to do more than one dance because I could do the cha-cha slide, but that was about it. Okay. <laughs> and so I couldn't wait, you know, all night long for one song to, to go and dance. So. That's right. <laughs> so that was she the finally, motivation. Well, she finally talked me into, you know, learn this dance and learn that dance, and here not, we are. Not okay. really. When you came home from COVID, I couldn't leave him by himself. Okay. And I had started taking these classes. They were outside. Okay. So I started taking him along with me. Okay. Um, in the beginning, um, Ernie had uh, uh, two bags. So he had an um, antibody bag that, that he would uh, um, have on his shoulder. And then he had another bag because he had a wound that was uh, a wound pack bag. Okay. And so I was like, I'm going to these classes and you're going with me. Got it. And mm-hmm. so we were, and since we were outside, I would take him mm-hmm. and I would take a chair mm-hmm. and I would sit him right there mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he would watch us dance. Wow. Um, and so then eventually the bags were removed mm-hmm. and he would still go mm-hmm. and he would still sit there. Hallelujah. Right. Finally. <laughs> Finally. It has happened yeah, to me. He started right. uh, getting up to, to learn the, the steps. The yeah. dancing bug. Well, I just had to get stronger because uh, uh, due to my illness, I had to learn how to walk all over again and strengthen myself. So it took a while before I was physically disabled to do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. So tell us about uh, the first time you recognized symptoms of COVID. You were not feeling well. Tell us about that. What happened? Um, interesting. That week I had just started on that Monday, I started a new position with the uh, Census Bureau. I was going to work with the Census again. Mm-hmm. And so I went in that Monday, you know, the whole group of us. Because you're were, retired at this point, right? Yes. Okay. So you retired after how many years? Um, 33 and a half years at GM. 33 and a half years at GM. So you've been retired now for X, how many years? 13 years. For 13 years. Okay. All right. Continue on then. We're into the COVID. So I had done the the, uh, census back in 2010, and this time I was going to do the census for 2020. Okay. So we came to the office, and you do the usual, you know, first day of work things. You fill out a bunch of forms, and they send you around. They 
give you some training, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so they were making some changes in the office. They told us, don't come back that Tuesday. They would call us when we could come back. We could complete our test and training online. So I did that. Okay. So anyway, on that Monday, there was this one guy that sat behind me that just kept coughing his head off. Cough, 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 cough. I couldn't believe it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, that, that can't be good because this one, this was in what, um, early March when COVID was first starting to become, you know, a real thing, mm -hmm. you know, and you had to be careful about it. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to do anything that Tuesday, which was good because I didn't feel great. I was like, you know, 80% wasn't bad, but just wasn't, you know, feeling 100. And then Wednesday started feeling a little worse and they were talking about um, food shortages and everything like that. So I went and stocked up the house. So Thursday, I could barely get out of bed. I was feeling poorly and, and Friday was the same. Finally, uh, last Saturday, uh, I tried to take a shower and it took me an hour to get dressed. Matter of fact, Janice had to help me get dressed because I was so weak. And uh, she just took me to the, uh, the emergency room and I didn't even bother to fuss or fight about it. You know, because normally, you know, man, we're going to put it off because we're tough and we're strong. But I knew this wasn't, you know, it was time to go mm -hmm. and I couldn't, I was so weak. I couldn't even get out the car. They had to come bring a wheelchair and get me out the car. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, um, they had me sitting in the emergency room and, uh, they had to send her home because they weren't allowing people to stay, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, after that I was admitted and, and I have the rest of the story, <laughs> but I didn't really know it was COVID as it turned out at that time I had double pneumonia caused by the COVID. And that's why I was feeling poorly because I was just um, doing the same kind of coughing, just hacking away like a smoker sack. But I had quit smoking a good 15 or 20 years earlier. So I know it wasn't because of smoking. You know. So did you connect it back to the guy that you were in the orientation that, that's, with? That's kind of what um, I think he boosted it because we, the, the chapter had gone out for breakfast on that Saturday and uh, there was like three other brothers that came down with COVID at the same time. Mine was uh, the worst. There was another brother also came to the hospital, but they didn't admit him. And, and a couple of other guys that had it, but their symptoms were not as severe as mine. Got it. Got it. And so it took how many days for yours to develop? I'll say five days. Five days. And then you are admitted into the hospital. Right. And you spent how many days in the hospital? 90 days total. Five days to develop, 90 days hospitalized. Wow. During that time, were you put on a ventilator? Twice. Twice on a ventilator. Wow. Because it was interesting because the first time they did, they told me that they were going to put me under. Um, I felt relatively confident about it because after about the third day I was there, I started feeling a little better because they pumped me full of antibiotics and, you know, were treating the pneumonia and stuff. So I felt a little better, you know, but they said that um, I wasn't progressing as I needed to and that they were going to put me under. So I texted Janice and told her they were going to put me under and, you know, see you in a few days when I get out. Mm -hmm. So I come out, they bring me back out and, um, a day later, two days later, they tell me that, um, you know, the, they didn't get the results that they wanted. They were going to put me back under again. So this time I sent her a text. I said, I wasn't quite so confident. <laughs> and um, How were you feeling at this time? In term, not emotionally, but physically. Physically, um, I wasn't great, but it didn't seem as though I felt any worse than I did when I first got there. Okay, you okay. Know. So they're looking, so they're dealing not based just on the clinical, they're they're making their decisions based on the lab results that were coming back. Right. Okay. Because um, the COVID was still there. It took me almost five weeks before I finally was clear of the COVID itself. But uh, at any rate, um, I sent Janice another text this time. I said, they're putting me under again. I love you. Goodbye. So... That one hurt. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then I, I came out, I found out that she is also in the hospital because of COVID, but hers was not nearly as severe as mine. And uh, as a matter of fact, about 
when they let her go, they, they came and they let her come visit me. So that was the first visitor I'd had in almost a month. Okay. And I had never heard that part of the story, that you had also gotten COVID. Tell me about your backdrop on that. So um, when Ernie came down with COVID, the first day that he came down with COVID, I noticed he was sick and coughing. Um, the second day, it was progressively getting worse. By Wednesday, I had said to Ernie, um, I think you need to go in the hospital. Um, you need to get checked. And Ernie kept saying, no, 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 I'm okay. Mm -hmm. That Thursday, I think when I got home, Ernie had went grocery shopping, like you said, um, and he had stocked me up for over a month, everything. I, I didn't even know stuff that I needed, but he had taken care of everything. And um, and I said to him, listen, Friday, I'm taking you in. Friday, when I came home, he was still in the same chair that I left him in that morning. And he s still kept saying to me, I don't wanna go. I said, well, you don't have a choice. And it was, I think, five o'clock, six. And all he could think of was, I'm gonna be in the ER room all night long. So I told him, all right, I give you one more day. Mm -hmm. Saturday morning, we're going. Mm -hmm. Saturday morning, he got up. Well, he didn't get up, I got him up because he was very, very weak. And I said, Ernie, can you take a shower? And he said, oh yeah. So he went in and he took a shower and I thought that was a long shower uh, for him. Um, and when he got out of the shower, he went into the bedroom and he was there for almost an hour. And that's not like him. And I went in to check him to see how he was doing, and he was laying down. And I looked at him and I said, I'm gonna dress you. And he didn't say a word, so I dressed him, mm -hmm. um, got him in the car, garbed him up with gloves and uh, mask, got to the hospital, and I said to Ernie, I'm gonna go in and get a wheelchair. I handed him the gloves and um, the mask, he held out his hand. And I said, when I come back, put these on. I came back, his hand was still held out and the glove was still in there. And I knew, I said, I can't get him out of the car. I went back and got the nurses and they came out and we put him in the car. At that time, um, no one could go in the hospital. So I sat in the car for about an hour and then I went home. When I went home, um, you know, I was exhausted, of course. Um, I did not know that I had COVID. I went and got tested and the results had not come back. The COVID testing at that time early on took a week to get them back. Okay. Because I have heart problems and blood pressure problems. COVID shows up in those areas also. So for me, my blood pressure started dropping and dropping and I called my cardiologist. My card and is your, is your blood pressure problem a low blood pressure problem or is it a high, high. blood pressure? My blood pressure is high. Okay. Um, and so my blood pressure originally started at 100 um, over 80 and then it started dropping more. Okay. And I, I, I noticed, you know, it was 90, you know, and it was over 70. Then it was 80 over, and when, by that time I called my cardiologist. Mm -hmm. He said that he had read um, um, in the journals that one of the things with COVID, it affects the blood pressure. Okay. Um, and this is an important thing for the viewers to note too, and that is that you had your own blood pressure cuff yeah in your home in my home and so you were able to monitor your blood pressure and that is a uh, medical instrument that everyone should have in yes. their homes absolutely okay absolutely um and so when um so my my doctor um encouraged me to go into the hospital when i went into the hospital they were surprised everything was dropping um and they decided, well, let's do a COVID test and came back 
I had tested positive for COVID. And this is how many days after Ernie? This would have been about two weeks after you had been in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but you think you had it prior to that in prior. terms of, you think you, you, you contracted it from Ernie? Um, I'm pretty sure I did because okay. um, one of the doctors told me that if he has it, you have it. Okay. When I was in the hospital. Okay. And it made sense. Okay. Um, I have learned that there's various stages of COVID and I have, and I've always felt that um, there is um, the worst stage there is, which Ernie had. And there is mild, which is what I had. Mm -hmm. So while I was in the hospital, my doctors took me off of my blood pressure medicine because it wasn't working. Um, and once they stabilized my blood pressure and because I was doing so well, I was able to um, sit up and I could shower and I could do all those things for myself. Mm -hmm. They felt that I could go home and recover mm -hmm. from COVID. Okay. So I went home a week later okay. with COVID. Okay. Um, and I recovered at home with COVID. Okay. Um, my uh, friendship network was was wonderful. Um, his fraternity stepped in mm -hmm. every day. Every day they were there mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. um, my church stepped in. Mm -hmm. um, my faith became stronger. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot going through COVID with Ernie, and I learned a lot on handling situations that he was dealing with while he was in the hospital. There were incidents where um, when Ernie came out of COVID the second time, Ernie had developed a wound on the side on his sacrum. When he came out with COVID the second time. So are you saying that he was released from the hospital? No, no, when he came out of the coma. Okay, so. From, from the second time. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, the wound was growing mm -hmm. and the wound was infected. Okay. And they had been watching this wound, which I was not aware of. Okay. And the wound was where? On his sacrum. Right on, on his sacrum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. And uh, Ernie, they had been telling him that his wound was was infected. Okay. Uh, the wound was the size of a grapefruit. Okay. You literally could put your whole fist inside his back. Um, and so what had happened was... The doctors felt that if they didn't operate on him, that he wouldn't make it. I was really concerned that um, they were going to do this surgery on him without discussing it with me. Mm -hmm. They discussed it with him, um, who was really not always there. He was on, he was heavily medicated. Sure. And they told him that he needed this surgery and Ernie felt like, well, if, if they think I need this, I need this. Right. The nurses and uh, myself developed a really strong um, uh, network of uh, talking to each other. Okay. I would call uh, mornings, afternoons, and night. And I wanted to know all the vital signs and what was going on with him. And I started doing things for the nurses. And the nurses started calling me and saying, the week of before the surgery that um, would you like to come up and see him mm -hmm. and I knew that um, nobody could go up and see him mm -hmm. and I said yes and they said well we talked to our supervisor and and she felt that you should come see him when I went up to the hospital to see Ernie um, it it was something out of a um, Kind of out of a, a, a of, of a nightmare to see him laying there hooked up to so many tubes mm -hmm. not able to talk or write tied up because being heavily sedated um, he would rip things off um, and just laying there like a vegetable sure i i wasn't expecting that because calling them they would give me all these great great news about him. Well, he's doing really good today. Mm -hmm. You know, and I yep. thought when I walked in the room, that was what I was going to see. see. Sure. But going in the room, I had to garb up. I had to put the garment on, the gown on, 
the mask on, the um, shield. shield on, and and they explained to me that if I came out of that room, I had to start all over again. So I decided that I'm going to put this on and it's going to stay on because I'm not going in and out because I didn't want to um, infect him with any kind of germs. Um, he was on the COVID floor, mm -hmm. uh, and I think the COVID floor had five COVID patients per nurse. I started sending the nurses treats, and we developed a relationship. So I would send brownies, cookies, cakes um, to them because they couldn't eat. Um, and I would send it for each shift because I found out that if you sent it for the first shift, the second shift didn't get it in the third. By doing this, they started opening up to me. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my first of three visits to visit him. Perfect. My second visit- Relationship building. The absolute. Mm -hmm. Gifts is a love language. Yeah. It's one of the five love languages. Yeah. And, yes. And they, they, they did appreciate it. Mm -hmm. My second visit came um, when the day of the surgery. So they called me up and said, would you like to come up on the day of the surgery? And I was surprised, the surgery. Mm -hmm. You're doing surgery on him? And they said, yes, we, the doctors have decided they, they have to do the surgery on him. And I said, yes, I will be there. Mm -hmm. And I was with him all day. The doctor came out and he said the surgery went well. He said, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know how much anesthetic we could give him because he's already on so much. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't have to give him any. Ernie came through like a trooper. Mm -hmm. The nurses told me every time I came up, he got better. Um, so my second time up there after the surgery, I looked at Ernie and I said, um, you need to be cleaned up. And, and Ernie said, yes. I said, we're gonna, we're gonna wash you up because the nurses were, were washing him, but not with soap and water. They were washing him with those little wet wipes. Um, and I noticed that um, the nurses used the same gloves as they washed him up, as they gave him his medication with the same gloves. And, and I reported that because um, there were a lot of bacteria on the gloves. Mm -hmm. Ernie developed E. coli in the hospital. He had five blood transfusions, uh, four blood clots while he was there. Um, and I felt a lot of it had to do with um, early on, um, they were just trying to take care of the patients because they did the best that they could do at that time. They didn't know how to um, handle COVID. Um, but my faith was strong mm -hmm. and, I, and I knew that uh, we were gonna come out of this. Mm -hmm. um, Ernie, on the other hand, was not so sure. Um, he, he basically uh, felt like he couldn't move, he couldn't walk. Um, he couldn't talk. He couldn't even hold a pencil to write to us. And I kept encouraging him the, the whole um, uh, time. I would call, I would have them put the phone to him so he could hear my voice. I would text him on his phone every day what was going on, the weather, you know, um, me planting flowers, um, people coming over, people checking on him prayer lines all over the world, all over the country. The Alphas had set up a national prayer line. Every Tuesday all over the world, they would come together and they would pray for Ernie. Um, and so I would talk to him like everything was okay. Downloading this into his visualization, his mindset, his understanding of the world outside of what he was experiencing. Well, that's that's why or how things got complicated i'll put it that way um the first time they put me under i felt confident about it i said a prayer because i rarely pray for myself but i pray for family everything else but rarely pray for myself because i'm okay I, I know that i'm capable of doing anything i need to do i just need to do it you know mm -hmm. so the lord's already given me those capabilities and we understand that, you know, it's just on me. I'm not going to ask for anything that 
you know, I don't need. But um, this was something that was beyond my control. So, you know, I said a prayer about it and they put me under. And like, like I said, generally speaking, I felt, you know, confident the first time. Second time, you know, having to go back under, I wasn't quite so confident. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, she told you about the, um, the bed sore that had developed and it had spread so far that, um, like she said, you could put, you, you could actually put your fist in. It was almost an inch deep, about four inches round. So I had this big old hole on my backside. I couldn't sleep on my back. So they had to come and move me every two hours from one side to the other. So I couldn't get real sleep in. And then um, it was during springtime and the days were getting longer. So I wake up early, I go back to sleep I wake up again and it was still light, but I'm thinking it's a different day. <clears throat> so I'm thinking the clock and the calendar is going backwards because it didn't make any sense to me. Um, another part of it is even though I could hear them talking to me and I could respond, I was still in the middle of hallucinations and dreams. So how can you give consent when you're still not there a hundred percent, you know? And that's why I would ask every day, you know, what day is it? Cause you know, I've been there too many days, you know, woke up and it was light again. <laughs> and for it not to be, you know, later than I thought it was, it didn't make any sense to me. But sure. um, um, that's why I was asking what day is it, what day is it? Because I didn't want to miss our anniversary. And um, I was thinking it was a lot later in the month than it actually was because I was waking up two or three times a day and it was still the same day. <laughs> but I didn't understand that, you know. Right. I didn't understand that. So um, heavily sedated, like I said, and um, it was so interesting. Uh, one, one, I had so many dreams. My whole, my whole life was, was in dreams. I've been to Belle Isle, Detroit about five or six different times. Um, I was on... Uh, on uh, on the prices light prices right, I went backstage and was talking to Drew Carey. I had all kinds of dreams about all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought they were real. I thought they were completely real. Um, I, I texted my cousin after I got out, and I told him to, to thank the people that he had helped me with and send my stuff back to my address. And he's like, "What are you talking about?" You know? <laughs> But the best one was my friend Ray from, from elementary school. I had a dream about him. And uh, he's written a couple of books, and he, had, he was going to come to Lansing and give a speech about it, but he needed me to take him down to, to uh, Detroit to the airport as soon as his speech was done because he had a flight to catch at 11. So I assured him that I would, and you know, everything was everything. Don't you know, on that Wednesday evening at 11 o'clock, I woke up, and I'm in terror because it's 11 o'clock, I got to pick up Ray. So I'm tearing the IV needles out of my arms and trying to get up out of bed. There's an alarm on my bed, so I can't get out. Part two of that, I'm so weak I couldn't get out anyway, but I'm trying to figure out where are my clothes, where are my keys, where did I park right. the car? Sure. You know, going yeah. through all this stuff. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to pull out the catheter and, and one of the male nurses says, you really don't want to do that. So I left that one alone. And <laughs> <laughs> things started coming, they told me I was dreaming and you know, it was slowly coming back to me, but it was just so real, you know, at the moment, you know, sure. that it was shocking. So that's why they had to put the mittens on me so I wouldn't rip out the IVs again. Right. They they called me on that one. They they uh, they were very good with communicating with me. Um, and they said Ernie had a restless night. He had many restless nights, but they said this one. This one, he woke up and he was pulling everything out. He went commando on everything and everyone and... You know, and he was telling them they couldn't stop him. And no, they, but I'm a grown ass man. You can't tell <laughs> me what to do. Right. Get out of my way. Right, you know? right, yeah. I was about it. And, you yeah, know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They had to sedate him some more. Sure. Yeah. Um, and and during that period, um, as he was coming out of sedation, one of the things that they kept telling me was, you know, he he just doesn't seem to want to stay stay awake. And I said, What do you mean? You know, you know, we try and sit him up. He falls asleep and. At that time, I didn't know that they had him on all these antidepressants because when they uh, put you in a coma, they do give you antidepressants because when you do wake up, they want to make sure you're calm. And I said to them, along with uh, morphine, he was on morphine too, I said, can you start backing him off with some of that stuff? Because 
um, I'm not taking him home on all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me and they were like, what do you mean? I said, well, I know he's not ready to go home, but you know, he is in a better place now mm -hmm. and um, he needs to come off of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So they started weaning him from um, all the medications and antidepressants and well i wasn't depressed you right. know I, I understood my situation mm -hmm. you know i thought i was getting better and i wasn't i never threw myself a pity party or what was me you know it's the end of the world i, I was never like that you know it's mm -hmm. like what's going to be it's going to be and i can do what i can do and things i can't do i can't worry about so i wasn't depressed about it mm -hmm. wasn't happy but i wasn't mm -hmm. depressed yes. about it you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. so for them to give me all the uh all the medications and the drugs that had me hallucinating like right, crazy didn't right, make any sense. Right. They had you on a standard operating procedure process yeah. type thing. And it, and it was mm -hmm. easy for them mm -hmm. because they yeah. didn't have to be in the room with him because mm -hmm. they were very nervous about that. Mm -hmm. And it took them 20 minutes to get dressed to get in there. And then they would have to take it off and put it back on to go into another room. Yes. Um, so early on very for them, large. Yeah, mm -hmm. but he had some good nurses. Uh, there were uh, there was a male nurse I can't remember his name, um, who said to me he volunteered to be a part of the COVID floor because he didn't have any uh, a wife or um, kids to worry about, and some of the younger uh, nurses did. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a nurse that volunteered on her weekends to come in and take care of Ernie. Um, that support meant a lot. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of great nurses. There was a couple that wasn't so great, but mm -hmm. you know, the vast majority did a fantastic job and I can't thank them enough. Um, it just, you could, well, you could tell the difference on the weekends when the, that's when I called the B team came in. Okay, uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh, uh -huh. You could definitely tell the difference. You knew, you know, when it was the weekend, but that was, that was the only time I was just, you know, so spaced out because of all the drugs that you know, I never really knew what was what, you know, because I could talk to you, have a conversation with you, and you had no idea what was tripping off in my head, mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, but I mm -hmm. could still respond to you. Sure. And uh, that, that was a peculiar part, but, you know, that, that's something that always amazes me, how you can give consent to something when you're not in your right mind. Right. But you can still respond, and they're not going to know you're not in your right mind. Right, so right. That, that was kind of spooky, but. Sure. It was it was interesting. Um, when I got there, um, they asked me how long I'd been a diabetic, and I'm like, since now, because <laughs> my blood sugar was up three hundred or something, I guess. Eight hundred. Eight hundred. Wow. And so they put me on insulin and everything, and then um, they had to wean me off of that because the insulin was making me dizzy. I could lie down on the bed, and I felt like I was upside down and sideways. So. Mm -hmm. um, now my blood sugar average is about, it's still a little high, about 110, but, you know, it's a far cry from 800. For sure. <laughs> That's why I can eat ice cream again. But, um, yes, I cut all that out. Um, I was on a good diet. And, um, like I said, having been there for so long, I had to learn how to walk again and everything. And that was all part of, to a certain extent, where I'm probably healthier now than before I got sick. Right. Right. Ernie came home with probably about 30 different pills. Okay. Um, eight blood pressure medicine. Mm. Um, and he had not had high blood pressure before? Not like that. No, it was mm -hmm. moderately high, but yeah. it wasn't, you know. Super elevated. Right. Okay, got it. Because COVID um, attacks whatever in your body there's an issue with. And so because his body wasn't making enough insulin, then he became a diabetic. Mm -hmm. um, because his blood pressure um, was not stabilized, it attacked his blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, those were the only things that it could find with Ernie. Now, Ernie had sinus problems and pneumonia was, was a part of that COVID. So it attacked that area. Okay. And because they had him on so many antibiotics, um, Ernie's sinuses now are great. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they're better than they than were. They've ever been. Ever. ever. True. Wow. True. Ever. Uh -huh. um, I mean, he's had, what, five sinus surgeries and was getting um, injections from the allergist once a month. Mm. He has not had an injection in two years. Mm -hmm. And he was looking at having a sinus surgery uh, before COVID. 
and that has cleared up. Wow. Interesting, well, they, huh? They poured so many, you know, antibiotics into me, whatever it was, they, they finally got to the root of it, I guess. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. <laughs> the blessings of COVID. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, well, it's just interesting. It's the best way I can put it. Um, but in, in terms of relationships, I, I was so glad that she was there for me. Because you need a strong advocate when you're in there because, you know, I wasn't in my right mind. I needed somebody to look out for me that, you know, knew me and, right. and would know a, a appropriate response for them. That's right. You know, so. In the medical field, because I've worked in the medical field for years. So I knew a little more than. Um, what is your profession? Well, I, I, I'm one of those people. I, I've worked in OB for probably two OBGYNs in the Lansing area, mm -hmm. Dr. Ronald Nichols and Dr. Moha. And it was by chance I ended up in both those jobs, but I was also political too. So I, I do a little bit of everything, but now I uh, I work for an oral surgeon. So, um, so I, I knew the questions to ask. I knew um, um, who to call. And when Ernie started moving from floor to floor, they moved him from the COVID floor to the cardiologist floor because the cardiologist floor is where you get the best care. And they felt with COVID patients, let's put them on that floor. Once you got to the cardiologist floor, they work you, they get you up, they make you move, they make you walk, they make you do everything. Um, the nurses had been talking to me about um, Ernie going to um, a facility there. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, uh, their rehab. Long term care. Yeah. And what was the name of it? It was um long term care. Right, but the name long -term of the facility. rehab or something. There's a name for it at Sparrow. Um I can't remember the name, but anyway, it's on their I think their eighth floor. Um Mary Freebed. Mary Freebed, absolutely. And they had been telling me that when he gets better, you need to move him to the Mary Freebed. And they explained to me that Sparrow also has a, uh, another long-term care program there, but the Mary Free Bed was the best. Okay. And so um, they told me to start calling and getting him on a list. So I started calling and asking Mary Free Bed questions. I started asking my insurance questions. Um, my insurance was very helpful. Um, Blue Care Network is what we had. Blue Care Network covered Ernie's hospital bill 100% for 90 days. Um, and so they were very informative to, to me. Sparrow, as Ernie got better, felt that we'll put him in the long-term care, which what happens is when they move you to the long-term care, your insurance starts over. So you can only, um, have I think like 200 and something days of being in the hospital. And then they have to release you. They'll release you to a rehabilitation place or your home, whatever. Then you come back in, it starts over again. So by me going into their long term, that meant that his care started over again. So he could be there another 200 days. But Mary Freebed is a little different. Um, so his long term stayed the same um, when he went to Mary Freebed. When he got to Mary Freebed, um, the care there is just unbelievable. They told him, they said, listen, we're gonna walk with you the first day. Um, let's walk up and down some stairs and see how you do. Well, it took a while to get the stairs, but um, they did a great job. Um, Mary Freebed or rehab um, is very intensive, whereas the long-term care is not. So um, Mary Freebred would, would work you, you know, they make you get up and do stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, at first when I was on the cardiologist floor, it was all I could do to get up. They had to help me up out of the bed to walk to the door with a walker and back, because that, that's all I could do. That's all I could do. After about a week, or so, uh, two weeks, I'll put it that way, about 10 days, I was able to walk up and down the hall, the nurse's station and back. So I was getting stronger, but essentially I just had to learn how to walk all over again because I was too weak. Um, 
they use a harness type device and you know overhead crane they would pick me up and, and put me in a chair just so I could sit there you know because I couldn't get there on my own I couldn't you know stand up and move you know move to the chair even though the chair was right here I was not strong enough to move myself over you know to get out of the bed so um, plus you lost 40 pounds um, you know, lost 30 pounds. I was, I was down to my high school weight. I wish I could have stayed there, but <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, I've, I've gained all of it back. All of it. Every single pound. <laughs> Wasn't happy about that. I could have got the little 10 or 12, but at any rate, um, the first time they um, wanted me to walk around the rehab area, I could only make it about three quarters of the way around, and that was, that was all the walking I could do, and they thought that I was going to be there for a while. But um, they don't know me, so <laughs> I wasn't going to have this. I was going to do better. Now, that was my whole philosophy about being in there, that um, I looked at every day was going to be an adventure, and every day was going to get a little better. Mm -hmm. you know, I was going to improve one way or another, and, and that helped carry me through. And uh, finally, by the end of the week, they were shocked at my progress. You know, and, and I was supposed to be there for about three weeks, and I got out in two weeks. Okay. But, so you were on the cardiac floor how many weeks? Uh, about two weeks. Two weeks on the cardiac floor. Yes. And then you transitioned to the Mary Freebed floor. Yes. And you were there for how many weeks? Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Right. And originally they told me they didn't know how long he was going to be there. Right. Okay. Um, Ernie always thought he was going to be there three weeks, but they thought he was going to be there longer. Mm -hmm. But he um, progressed quickly because he wanted to get out of there mm -hmm. he was determined yeah uh, he was not gonna stay another day mm -hmm. and so every time i came up ernie was sitting up and you know they were cleaning his wound and you know all that um but i'm very thankful that the nurses told me about mary freebed because um i had started getting calls from other facilities other rehabs in the area because once the hospital alerts that they have a patient that needs rehab all the local areas start calling me mm -hmm. and they had told Ernie that he was going to be leaving. So he panicked. He called me and he said, they, they're telling me that I'm leaving here. And I said, no, you're not. No, that's not what they're saying. And I explained to him, listen, I'm talking to my insurance and talked to a young man there um, several times. And he told me we're not releasing him because we see that he can't walk. He can't do that. We're getting the information, um, and he said, and I'm talking to you on a regular basis, that trust me, when we're releasing, we'll let you know. So I would tell Ernie, and the nurses would still tell him, no, you're, you're, you're not going to be here any longer. And I said, Ernie, don't worry about it. I said, I've got this handled. I've got a hand, and God has a hand in this, because I know you can't go home like this. Mm -hmm. um, even with rehab coming to the home, you still are not where you need to be mm -hmm. but the hospital felt like okay it's time to move him out of here and you know let's make room well, they got to make room for other patients, other patients. I understand that. yeah yeah but, yes it was quite the experience to say the least um, my feet had swollen up i couldn't feel them they were completely numb i felt like i just had two you know rocks on the bottom of my legs because i couldn't feel anything they were swollen up i couldn't get uh Sock, barely get socks on, couldn't get my shoes on. Mm -hmm. My fingertips were numb. I couldn't feel anything in my fingers. And I was seriously concerned I was going to lose my hands and I was going to lose my feet. Sure. Um, my, my hands were still numb even when I got home. I couldn't take the cap off a water bottle. I couldn't tie my shoes because I had no feelings in my fingers. Wow. And, uh, yeah. What do you think resuscitated that? I don't know. You Does know, that sound circulatory? don't know you know what that was about but, i think um, that was part of the long haul culprit okay because be. there's the short and the long haul um some people still are experiencing uh side effects because he was there 90 days who knows he, he could have had the long haul all along yeah because well, yeah, the COVID was cured so to speak but then i had the infection on my back and that's what took the longest time for me to recover enough from that where I was able to, you know, do other things. But sure. because of that, I was still stuck on, I won't say my back, but on my side because I couldn't lay on my back. If I ever laid on my back, it was horrendous pain. 
you know, and then they had to roll me over to get to the other side. Sure. Or change the uh, wound dressing. It was just, and plus I was too weak to pull myself around and move me. So it's never easy when somebody else has to move you. That's right. You know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was an adventure. So. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. but you had to keep that attitude that it's going to get better. Yeah. So once you got home, and now the continuation of rehab is happening by way of services coming into the home yes okay and so what was there what were their procedures that were helping you to continue with this rehabilitation um okay i had an occupational therapist that would come in and um, help me to be able to get in the bathtub and get out uh, to get on the toilet and get off um, minor things like that you know just to move around the house from one place to another mm -hmm to make sure I could do that satisfactorily. And for how many weeks? She was there for about, what, three weeks maybe? Yeah, okay. okay. And then um, um, the um, physical therapist, he had to help me um, so I could get my balance, so I could stand up and, um, and <coughs> excuse me, and start walking around even in the house. And finally, I was able to get outside and, and walk down the driveway and you know back and then eventually i made it to the corner and back and then around the block and back and um i was able to do better than that and so then i started using just the cane instead of the walker but it was the same thing i could only go so far you know with the cane i had to go back so it took a while but i finally was able to begin to walk again i could walk a mile with the cane and then I left the cane at home and I could walk a mile by myself and then I just started walking. <laughs> wow. And then the nurse. You had you had a nurse that Oh yeah, a visiting nurse. She was great, Jenny. The, the physical therapist was that three weeks as well? Occupational was there. therapist was three Occupational weeks. Occupational was about three weeks. Uh -huh. um, was Bill was there about five, six weeks. Yeah, five, six weeks, yeah. painfully. Physical therapist, yeah. five, six weeks. Yeah. Okay. Three days was, a week. It was a slow process. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And and the, and the nurse, um, there were some days she would even come. Um, Cause she had day. to change the uh, dressing on the wound on my backside. Okay, and so she came every day. Every every other every, day. every every other day. Okay. In the beginning, she was every day. Okay, and then every other day for how long? Oh man, for about six weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, about eight All weeks, right. couple maybe, months anyway. Yeah, maybe eight weeks. Okay. So a lot is going on for quite some time. Yes, because even, cause even though I was discharged, I wasn't 100%. That's right. Because um, I still had an infection in my heart. So I had a pick, what they call a pick line, they put it in my arm, but it, it goes into the chest cavity. And they were injecting the antibiotics into me 24 hours a day. Even at home? Even at home. For so, seven weeks. So I had this, you know, bag that I had to carry every day. And then I had a wound pump, which would pump out the fluid, you know, how infections get and, you know, the fluid bubbles up. So that would take the fluid off of me. So uh, she had to change the dressing for that, you know, every couple of days. So even though I came home, I still wasn't complete, still wasn't whole, you know. Right. And wa walking with those two bags was An adventure. very, yeah, yeah. Ernie, yeah. Ernie would trip almost every time, mm -hmm. but he still would walk. Because we've got the pick line bag, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what's the second bag? It's for a wound pump. Okay, so it, that's it, going into the, the infected area. Mm -hmm. the and that was bag. 24 hours too. And that was 24 hours. And noisy, yes. very noisy. And very yeah. noisy. I had to sleep with them, so I could only sleep on the one side because I couldn't turn over and sleep on the other side, so. My, 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 what a journey. Mm -hmm. It was quite the adventure, yes. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. No. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to lose 30 pounds, that's not that, the way to do it. Right <laughs> no. No. Exactly. So, when do you know, at what point do you know we have beat this thing? I am 100% myself again. At what point? How far from, from coming home? to the point of being back to full function. How long was that? Um, I left the hospital on June 19th, Juneteenth. That was my personal liberation day. Mm -hmm. um, it was October when I had my last medical treatment.
for COVID. Okay. And that was at an outpatient clinic that had to, um, um, I can't think of the term anymore. Anyway, they, was, they would scrape my wound, so scrape the scar tissue off the wound so it could heal. And that was end of October before I finally had my last treatment there. Okay. And at that point, are you walking like a mile by yourself and all yes. that? Okay. Okay. For almost eight months. For about eight months. So we got eight months at home. Recovery. Um, a total of eight months with COVID. 90 days in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And six months, maybe five months at home. Yeah, that would be another four to five months after after release. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And and we are so very lucky. We know that because COVID at that time, people didn't know anything about it and didn't know how to treat or what to do. You know what precautions were necessary. Mm -hmm. Because they were, you know, literally they were scared of me <laughs> because, of course, they didn't want to come down with this. Who sure, sure, sure. You know? And like she said, every time you came in the room, you had to put on all this uh, protective equipment. That's right. Even if you're only there for five minutes. That's right. And at that or that census orientation, were the mask mandates in place at that time yet? Oh, there was nothing in place nothing at that time. Nothing in place at that time? No. Okay. Got it. Well... Truly meant to be here. Walking miracle. Walking yes. miracle. Lots of ways Walking about miracle. it. No doubt about it. Uh, you know, it always makes me pose the question, um, you know, out of all the people that passed away because of this, you know, what, and my condition was rather severe, why did it save me? Rather you know, I'm, severe. I'm just, a, I'm just an average guy, you know. I'm not the most pious, so I'm not the most... I'm not the nicest person in the world, et cetera, you know. Mm -hmm. What is there about me that you wanted to keep me around for, you know, so that I could make my journey worthwhile? Right. But a lot of people have told me they've been inspired by my journey, so I take that to heart. Absolutely. Your uh, it was your faith, your faith in God. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you feel uh, that you've come back completely to yourself? Do you feel like you're a different person because of the experience? What is your sense of yourself? Um, generally speaking, I would say more appreciative. Um, I always try to be appreciative of people and, and whatever kindnesses were extended my way. Um, I don't believe in using people or, you know, there's no point in being rude, mean, and crude to folks. I always try to be helpful if I can, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm human. I fail at that from time to time. Mm -hmm. But, um, I just enjoy the little things of life. I love seeing my grandkids. I love, you know, um, being nice to folks. Um, even the whole time I was there, I never saw the moon. I was talking to Janice on the phone one time, and she was outside. I could hear the birds chirping. I never heard the birds chirp, you know. I'm just tiny things in life that you never really consider, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, and that's one, one of the reasons why I enjoy going out walking, because I walked the river trail from, um, from my house through Powder Park and then back, you know, and it goes all along the river and see the ducks and the geese and, you know, wildlife and watch the seasons change and it just is amazing, you know. Yeah. But it's, it's calm and relaxed and I just really enjoy it. You and know? you're just so much more observant mm -hmm. now. And just a peace of, of mind, The yes. whole life experience, the nature, yes. the small things. And, mm -hmm. and also the fragility of life and how precious it is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And with you, Janice, you know, it seems like your backdrop of your profession uh, in working in these medical environments really served oh, this yeah. situation very, 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 very well, amazingly well. Absolutely, because I was able to uh, report things that I saw mm -hmm. that, that I knew um, could have been handled differently mm -hmm. um, in the supervisors that make sure that uh, it didn't happen again. Mm -hmm. And mind you, I only got in there three times and I could see these things. Sure. And I, I really feel that uh, early on, people coming in with COVID, they did not have that family uh, there yeah, for them. those eyes, the observance, yeah. Because they didn't realize how important it was to talk to the nurses. Um, and the nurses probably didn't realize um, you know, 
the things that I did that was different, you know, calling three times a day and being the only person that called um, because they respected that and they would tell me that. Sometimes families, everybody was calling. That was very confusing um, to nurses. But they were waiting for my calls some mornings at six o'clock when we knew you were calling. Mm -hmm. He's doing good today. I said, well, good. Um, can I see him? Can you um, tell him I love, love him? Um, mm -hmm. And they would do that. And then I started taking pictures up to go on the wall so he could see us yes. every day mm -hmm. um, and know that uh, we, were, we were there. And if every day we would call him at 7.30. And one day we missed calling him at 7.30 and he had the nurses call us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a family, we yes. would get on um, my daughters from all over and we would talk to him. He couldn't talk, but he would listen to all three of us. Um, well, I had a feeding tube that came to my nose and down my throat, so uh, whatever I said was illegible. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, I, I, mm -hmm. I made perfect sense to myself, but mm -hmm. apparently I'm, I'm finding out that they couldn't understand a word. They, they responded appropriately, so I, I figured they understood what I was saying. Absolutely. <laughs> he could text every once in a while, and one day he texts, that he was going home, and he wasn't. He was on the COVID well, floor. I was leaving the hospital, you know, in terms of medical treatment, I was going to rehab. So as far as I was concerned, I was done with the hospital. Of course, it was in the same building, but, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. that was the end of my medical treatment for COVID at the time. Absolutely. So that's why I said I was leaving the hospital. I know that's not somewhat confusing, but to me, it was a big difference. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So through it all, what do you value most about each other? I'm just eternally grateful that she was there for me and, and wanted to see me um, survive and prosper. Um, we had <coughs> conversation that was difficult because it was at a time that I thought I was gonna lose my hands and my feet. And I told her that, you know, this is what you got, you know, this is what you really want, you know, to be, because I thought I was going to be quadriplegic, you know, and, and not be able to do anything. Mm -hmm. I know it's a heck of a burden to put on somebody. Mm -hmm. And are you really capable and, and, and able and willing and, and, and want to do this? Mm -hmm. She said, what do you mean? You're going to walk again. Right. You know, it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. I bet she was right. Because uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you looked at me and I remember you saying, are you sure about this? I'm absolutely sure. Mm -hmm. And I told him, look at me, Ernie. Will I lie to you? And he, right. he looked at me because he, he could always tell if I'm not telling the truth. Okay. And so, <laughs> so, he, so, he, so he knew. He knew I wasn't just saying that. Mm -hmm. I, I believed in, with all my heart that he was going to walk again. Mm -hmm. and, and he did. Mm -hmm. you know, I made mm -hmm. sure he knew that, and I made sure the hospital knew that, and the staff knew that, yes. and everyone else. I made sure they knew he had a family, and that he had a support network, and that that network um, was going to be calling and asking questions and wanting to know, why haven't you called me, and what does this report say? And, and, and they were ready for me with every question. Mm -hmm. um, they started realizing that there's a person that cares about him, and they started caring about him. Absolutely. And that was another thing about the isolation because, you know, they came in to do their job, but they never talked to you as a person to person conversation. You know, how are you doing today? And, you know, what do you think about this? You know, just basically a meat bag they had to treat and cure and get out of here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. And that, that's why you feel so isolated and alone because it's a lack of, you know, interpersonal mm -hmm. communication. Relationships and mm -hmm. communication, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the so the medical profession would do well by its patients uh, to add companioning services yes. uh, into the mix well, had, as a part of the staff. I right. mean, because family couldn't be there to to provide that. Well, they had a support person that came in on Sundays and and gave you a, a quasi religious you know experience, mm -hmm. but. You know, I didn't have any problem with that. I'm mm -hmm. doing fine, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not the world's most religious person, but, um, you know, uh, my prayers were answered, so I was secure in, in how I felt about things, mm -hmm. you, know. Mm -hmm. you know. So it truly was that that companion, not so much 
that was missing mm -hmm. in terms of a because when we go through experiences we get to find out what's great about the experience mm -hmm. what's missing from the experience mm -hmm. and i'm hearing you say that conversation was missing just on an interpersonal level right um to feed the spirit of the human being yes you know definitely mm -hmm. because at that time uh, they canceled the ncaa's and and March Madness is my favorite time of the year. I, mm. I love it, you know. Mm -hmm. It's all canceled. There's nothing, you know. Nothing on television so that's doing nothing, it for you. Right. For you, you know, to be just, excited about, have emotion look, about. Yeah, to look yes. forward to or anything, yes. you know. Sure. A bunch of reruns and stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, it just, God, it was boring. Yes, you know? yes, yes, just yes. Just plain old boring. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. 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 I get it. <laughs> I mean, I totally get that. And, um, you know, you can watch daytime TV, but so much, you know, it's just mind numbing after a while. Mm -hmm. I remember calling up there one time when you came out of your coma the second time and, um, asking how he was doing. And they said, well, he's doing really good. He's sitting up watching TV. And I said, really, you know, how, how is he doing that? He can't talk or anything. Mm -hmm. Well, he can tell us what uh, channel to turn to. And I said, Oh, okay. How is he doing that? Mm -hmm. His eyes. His eyes would tell them if they got the channel he wanted to see. Okay. And then there were other times they would yeah, sit Because they up. don't have Comcast there, which I'm used to, you know, so I didn't know where to find what whatever channels, channel I right. thought I wanted to look at, you know. That's right. Yeah. Right. So what were you doing? You were just motioning to say, keep I, turning? Keep I guess. Turning? Uh, yeah. Because uh, they would ask you. Uh -huh. like, I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, they told me. They said that they would... Um, and see, I asked lots of questions. That's how I knew he was sitting up. Mm -hmm. um, and they said that they would uh, turn the station and they would ask you, do you want this station? And you would blink if you did mm -hmm. one time, blink twice if you didn't, and you were doing that. Got it. Um, so that was their way of communicating with you. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. And going to you, Janice, with your husband not being at home for all this time, thereby he's not doing whatever his normal duties are mm -hmm. um, in the home. What did you learn to appreciate all the more about uh, his presence um, and just an appreciation for him overall? What was your learning experience with that? Um, because Ernie's always been a strong person. He's always pushed me to be stronger than um, what he felt um, that I was. Okay. And I didn't have time to think about poor me. My concentration was strictly on him. And so I was doing things. I was gardening and I was um, outside getting the, the house ready for when he was coming home every day. And he would call and he would say, what are you doing? I said, you know, I'm going to send you some pictures of, of the garden, the flowers. And, uh, and having friends come by, even though they couldn't come in, um, you know, his president of his fraternity, Harold Pope, and his wife, uh, Jennifer, every day they came by and th we would cry through the window, um, you know, because they felt my pain and I felt their pain. And we, we knew that um, that he was going to um, I did make you it. But the pastors <laughs> at the window there. You know, through, through this. And so... I, I was lucky. I was I was just very lucky. I became stronger um, because of him, and and I also understood that uh, this walk was not my walk. This journey was not my journey, but I was supposed to go on it with him, and and we made it through the journey. Absolutely, so you did. Well, in closing, I just want to say that. Um, I have written this book series entitled 101 Conversational Questions. The book series is available on Amazon.com. I wrote the book series uh, because of the joy of conversation um, that I had experienced in my marriage and extended family. And in your uh, commentary, Ernie, regarding the value of conversation 
um, it comes full circle to bring our viewers to the attention of the series. I want to thank you all for purchasing the series. And I want to thank you for sitting here with me today, sharing okay. this most important story. And I want to bring to the attention again of the viewers, the importance of conversation. It's important. It really is validating. Uh, the isolation that you felt is an isolation that so many have felt during this COVID period. And because of the COVID period that we've been in, people still are fearful. Uh, do I hug you? Do I not? Do I talk to you? Do I not? Because different people feel different ways in, in terms of um, how they're handling the current period that we're in, where we're trying to come out of this and transition out of this, but we've gotten into these protocols and routines that are easier uh, to break for some than others. Uh, so again, I just want to... Thank you okay. and reinforce to our viewers the importance of relationships, the positivity of relationships that feed our souls, feed our spirit, and add to the quality of our lives. Um, so we're going to wrap up at this point, and I'm going to ask the viewers if you would please make certain that you hit that subscribe button, hit the like button leave a heart in comments, and share this video of this story of life, love, and COVID survival with the Kabuls, Ernie and Janice. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye now.